purple dartboard. There, from ancient grey farmhouses, monumentally hewn from moorland granite, Devon farmers rest a living from marginal land too damp for corn drying. From scattered farms like these, from a sprawling parish of some 25 square miles, the school bus collects its daily muster of children, bringing them to the village school at Whittacombe. The little school has 40 children, two teachers. Many of these children have already walked a mile to reach the bus. In the village square, the sexton, born and bred a Dartmoor man, tends his 14th century parish church, the Cathedral of the Moor, a church enriched by the boom wealth of the 16th century moorland tin miners. Across the village green at the 20th century cafes, the waitresses prepare to greet the day's onslaught of cars, coaches, curious sightseers and tired aching feet. At the old inn, the landlord sweeps his forecourt and tells visitors that Brandy, his brown and cream St. Bernard, is the most photographed dog in England. Next door, the old village forge is now a gift shop, where each day the souvenirs are put on show, memories of a summer day in Devon. Just outside the village, the lady of the guest house cleans her home, dusting, polishing, brushing and scrubbing, in a way most women have almost forgotten, by hand. For picturesque though it is, this is a parish without electricity. As recently as 15 years ago in the southwest, only two farms in ten had electricity. Today, only two farms in ten are without it. The canvassers 
job is to visit everyone in the area and find out what kind of electrical appliances, agricultural or domestic, they are likely to use. In the case of farms, he helps the farmer estimate what proportion of the capital cost he will have to pay. This amount is based on farm acreages and can be paid in installments over a number of years. The results of all these interviews are collated and analyzed, and on them is based the future program of development. Once an area is to be developed, planning engineers plot a possible route and go over the ground to see if it is practicable and inconspicuous. The next stage is to gain the consent of the landowner or occupier across whose property the line may go. This consent is termed a way leave, and the man whose job it is to obtain it is the way leave officer. A good way leave officer has at his fingertips current land values, crop prices and tree values. He must be well versed in the relevant acts of parliament and way leave regulations. He must know how to settle claims, decide compensation, agree on payments, and keep records. He must possess unlimited patience and inexhaustible tact. The closest cooperation is maintained with a county planning officer, the rural councils, and the National Parks Committee. Subject to this planning approval, the final instrument survey of the line is carried out. This decides the precise routing of the line. From this survey, draftsmen prepare a profile of the line, showing the ups and downs of the ground over which the line will run, and recording the nature of the ground, whether arable, pasture, or wooded. The draftsmen use this profile to decide exact details, height of poles, their diameter, types of cross arm, and sizes of stay to guarantee the line against wind pressure, sag, or icing. If everything is satisfactory, schedules of materials are drawn up, and the construction of the line is approved and authorized. After months or even years of planning, the line is at last to become a reality. Without such planning, there would be inefficiency and waste. The line to Whittacombe was a stage in an eventual through line linking Buckfast Lee to Morton Hampstead. The existing stage of the line ended at the village of Holm. From here, the Whittacombe line was to cross the valley of the Dart to a straw. Then it was to go, by way of Poundsgate and Ponsworthy, to the Valley of the Weathern, and so to Whittacombe, throwing out spurs to outlying areas. Just beyond Whittacombe, the line would terminate, but in such a way that on some future date, it can be extended across the moor. The engineer's first problem was to get the line across the Valley of the Dart. The river itself is not deep, but its valley is steep-sided and heavily timbered. It's a beautiful river, and it was decided to cross it at a point normally inaccessible to tourists, where the minimum of tree felling would be necessary. The power line was to be strung across the whole valley in a single span of a thousand feet. Various ideas were suggested for getting the conductor across, but in the end, it was unreeled in a drenching Dartmoor drizzle by the oldest and simplest method of them all. crosses the open country of Ashtor. To avoid the ugliness of poles and cables breaking the moorland skyline, this section of the line was laid underground. 
but putting this kind of line underground costs six times more than overhead. Only in such special sections of the route can the heavy extra cost be justified. Beyond Ace Tor, the route goes overhead again and pole erection becomes the order of the day. From a central distribution store at Taunton, poles of the required length and diameter come by articulated lorry, negotiating with care the narrow roads and steep gradients of the moor. The ground is cleared, and at intervals, dumps of poles and materials are made. machinery first digs a hole, then normally lifts the pole into position. But so difficult was the terrain of the moor that most of the poles had to be levered into position by hand. Lies. 
Into the valley bottom went the line, and into the water and the mud. Even at the best of times, the moor is wet, and this particular summer was not a dry one. The wide valley, or wide coombe, from which Widdicombe may derive its name, is often waterlogged. Water underfoot, rain overhead. It even rained the day the last pole went up. Between them stretch 15 miles of high voltage and 2 miles of low voltage line. A mile of the line is underground. The scheme serves 30 farms and more than 100 cottages. 170 separate way leaves were necessary, and in the course of obtaining way leave permissions, the way leave officer was twice bitten by dogs.
lights in the village came on. Power had come to Whittacombe. But this is not the end of the story. Encouraging people to use electricity implies a responsibility to provide the electricity in the amounts required. More power lines mean more consumers. Bigger sales of appliances mean greater consumption. chapter in the unending narrative of public service to the community at large.